Hey guys, um, so here we are, the last and final lecture of the 2020 school year. Um, the last thing you guys need to help you with your final projects. Um, so this is the slide we left off on. We were talking about oxidative phosphorylation um, and it being powered by redox reactions. <clears throat> so oxidative phosphorylation accounts for almost 90% of the ATP production in cellular respiration. A smaller amount of ATP is formed during glycolysis and during the citric acid cycle um, by something called substrate level phosphorylation. For each molecule of glucose that gets degraded um, into carbon dioxide and water by the whole respiration process, the cell can make up to 32 molecules of ATP. And 90% of that is done during oxidative phosphorylation. So I'm just kind of looking. Substrate comes in um, with a molecule of phosphate, binds to the ADP molecule, makes a product, and a molecule of ATP is a result. So glycolysis is the harvesting piece. Um, it's responsible for harvesting chemicals that are energized by oxidizing glucose into a pyruvate. Glycolysis means the splitting of sugar. It breaks down glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. Glycolysis occurs within the cytoplasm and has two major phases, the energy investment and the energy payoff phase. Glycolysis occurs when um, there is or is not oxygen present. This is kind of what is going on. So we have glucose comes in, we get two molecules of ATP are used to split the glucose um, energy payoff. We get four but if you really think about it, we used two, so we only gained two. At the end, we end up with two molecules of pyruvate. After pyruvate gets oxidized, the citric acid cycle's job is to complete the energy yielding oxidation of the organic molecules. In the presence of oxygen, pyruvate enters the mitochondria in eukaryotic cells where the oxidative um, oxidation of glucose gets completed. So the first thing that happens is pyruvate is oxidized to make acetyl-CoA. Um, before the citric acid cycle can begin, pyruvate must be converted into acetyl-coenzyme A. We call it CoA or acetyl-CoA, um, which links the glycolysis to the citric acid cycle. This step is carried out by, carried out by multi-enzyme complex that catalyzes three different reactions. First, your second reaction, or your first reaction comes here, your pyruvate goes in, it lets go of a molecule of carbon dioxide, NAD comes in to make NADH, and then the third reaction is when the coenzyme comes in to make acetyl-CoA. The citric acid cycle also is called the CREB cycle. Um, this completes the breakdown of pyruvate into molecules of carbon dioxide. The cycle oxidizes organic fuel that is derived from pyruvate that generates one molecule of ATP, three molecules of NADH, and one molecule of FADH2 per turn. So your, your pyruvate comes in, it becomes acetyl-CoA that grabs into the citric acid cycle, two molecules of carbon dioxide, three molecules of NADH, one molecule of ATP, one FADH2. The citric acid cycle has eight total steps that are responsible for catalyzing the specific enzyme. The acetyl group of acetyl-CoA joins the cycle by combining um, a molecule to create citrate. This is why we call it the citric acid cycle. It's the first molecule that is made during the cycle. The next seven steps decompose the citrate back into um, that original molecule that stays inside the cycle, making the process remain secular. The NADH and FADH2 that are produced by the cycle rely, uh, relay the electron, electrons extracted from the food to the electron transport chain. Looking, we have our super complicated um, cycle that we go from citrate to isocitrate all the way around, and then we go back around again. During oxidative phosphorylation, the chemiosynthesis or chemiosmosis couples the electrons to help ATP synthesis occur. 
Following glycolysis in the citric acid cycle, NADH and FADH2 account for most of the energy that is extracted from the food. They're your electron carriers. They're just carrying it through the steps. These two electron character carriers then donate their electrons to the electron transport chain, which powers ATP synthesis via oxidative phosphor phosphorylation. The electron transport chain is in the inner mitochondria or the cystae um, of the mitochondrion. It's the inner membrane. The most, most of the chain's components are proteins, which exist as multi-protein complexes. The carrier alternate, um, the carriers alternate and reduce and oxidize states as they are accepting and donating electrons throughout the chain. Electrons drop um, the free energy as they go down the chain and are finally passed to molecules of oxygen forming water, which is a byproduct. So it just comes right down this chain. Electrons enter, they move through, and we get our energy to make water. Electrons get transferred from molecules of NADH and FADH2 to the electron transport chain. They are passed through a number of proteins um, to molecules of oxygen. The electron transport chain generates no ATP directly. It breaks the large free energy drop from food to oxygen into smaller steps that release energy in manageable amounts by our cells. The last thing you want is a huge burst of energy within your cell that can burn out really fast. This is a slow release that helps slowly release it so your cells can manage that much energy at once. Chemiosmosis on the energy coupling mechanism. So electron transfer in electron transport chain causes proteins to pump hydrogen atoms from the inner the mitochondrial matrix into that inner membrane space. The hydrogen then moves back across the membrane through a protein um, passing through the photon the proton ATP synthase. I like to think of ATP synthase as a revolving door. If nothing is there to move it, it won't move. But hydrogen moves it, which causes the energy to be created. It uses an, ender, an exergonic flow of hydrogen to drive the phosphorylation of ATP. This is an example of chemiosmosis, um, the work, the use of energy in hydrogen gradient to drive cellular work to happen. So this is why I like to visualize it as a rotating door. It's always drawn like a rotating door. So the hydrogen comes in, it spins it, it helps it move. As it spins, it creates ATP. The energy stored in the hydrogen gradient across the membrane couples the redox reactions of the electron transport chain to ATP synthesis. The hydrogen gradient is referred to as the proton motive force that emphasizes its capacity to do work. Um, an accounting of ATP production by cellular respiration. So during cellular respiration, most of the energy flows in the sequence that is going from glucose to NADH to the electron transport chain to the proton motive force to ATP. About 34% of the energy in glu a glucose molecule is transferred to ATP during cellular respiration and makes about 32 molecules of ATP per glucose molecule. There are several reasons why that number of ATP is not exactly known. So visualizing all of cellular respiration happening, glucose to pyruvate is your glycolysis. You get two NADH um, that can move, and most of them go right down to that electron transport chain um, through oxidative phosphorylation. Pyruvate goes into the pyruvate oxidation to make two molecules of acetyl-CoA. We get two more NADH, okay, that can move on down to oxidative phosphorylation. The citric acid cycle makes six NADH and two FADH2 to oxidative phosphorylation. At glycolysis, you get two ATP. The citric acid cycle, you get two ATP and oxidative phosphorylation anywhere from 26 to 28 ATP molecules. 
And that is where we're stopping. We are not going into fermentation. Fermentation is the anaerobic part of cellular respiration. So the, cre the creation of um, energy without oxygen. But we're not going to worry about that. You guys have a final project due. Um, you guys have been so awesome, especially during this time. Make sure you're working hard on your final projects. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And I hope you guys have a fabulous summer.